the scripture says that Jesus went into the temple and he found money changers commercializing the house of God. Specifically, they were buying and selling doves. The Bible is very clear what was the commodity. It was doves. A dove is a symbol of the Holy Ghost. It's a symbol of the gentleness and the sensitivity of the anointing. Everyone say the anointing. So symbolically, this is an attempt to commercialize anointing or to reap financially from holy things, from things spiritual. And this was in the temple. The Bible says when he saw this, he went out and he fashioned a whip. Didn't go to the local store to buy a whip. The Bible says he personally fabricated one. He fashioned a whip. A whip designed to cleanse the temple from commercializing the Holy Spirit's anointing. The Bible says he came in there and he overthrew the tables. You can picture like a violent Jesus. This is not your Jesus meek and mild. He's extremely angry. And he overturned the tables and the Bible says and he drove them out of the temple. And when they were all out, he quoted a verse from the Old Covenant. And he says, it is written, my father's house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den or a cave of thieves and robbers. The house ceased to be the house and the house degenerated to a cave. Whenever there is a lack of prayer in a house, the propensity is for the house to lose its stature, to lose its power. And the house dissolves. There's a devolution from what it should be. So it should be a house. But Jesus says, this now is not a house. This is a den of thieves. This is a cave of thieves. But my house, he said, everyone say my house. My house. He says, my house will be called a house or an oikos of prayer for all nations whenever we pray it's let thy will be done on earth as it's done in heaven prayer is the connecting point the connecting principle between heaven and earth and there's no other better venue for heaven's will to be done in and through but in the venue of the house of god because the house of god is the portal everyone say it's the portal right it's the medium if you would uh, Jacob had a, a dream or a vision in Genesis 28 and he saw a ladder from earth reaching heaven. You recall the dream. And he saw angels ascending and descending. Everyone say traffic. traffic. So there was traffic between heaven and earth. There's a point on the earth and there's the heavens. But there was a traffic of angelic activity between heaven and earth. And when he awoke from the dream, he said, this is Bethel. Everyone say Bethel. Bethel. Which means what? The say the house, the house of God. So the house, everyone say the house. The house is where you should have angelic traffic or activity connecting heaven and earth. Tell your neighbor there's angelic traffic here. There's angelic traffic here. There's no other locus point. No other spot in the earth. No other venue where heaven gravitates towards. In fact, do you know what Jacob said when he awoke? He said, this is nothing else than the gate of heaven. It did not say it's the gate to heaven. He said it's the gate of heaven. Of heaven. In other words, what do you do with gates? Everyone say, we go through gates. We go through gates. Portals, access points, right? And Jacob had a revelation. Jacob said, if God wants entry into the point, into the earth, he looks for a house. He, God, looks for a gate. And the house has become the gate of heaven, where heaven's will can be done in earth's reality. Tell your neighbor, welcome to the gate. Welcome to the gate. Tell your neighbor, welcome to gate ministries. <laughs> Say, this is the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. Tell your neighbor, this is not a den of thieves. This is not a den of it's not a cave of robbers. It's not a cave of robbers. This is a house of prayer. This is a house of Come prayer. Come on, tell someone this is a house of prayer. This is a house of prayer. 
This is a house where people know how to pray, how to touch God, how to connect to heaven, how to bring heaven down, how to activate heavenly traffic, connecting heaven and earth. So I want you just to lift up your hands. Say, Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. I want to seek your face. Let that be your prayer. Seek your face. Lord, make me a house. Let the fire of my altar never burn up. Let the fire of my altar never burn up. Let the fire of my altar never burn up. Make me a house. Come on, pray, church. Let the fire of my altar never burn up. Let the fire of my Let the fire come on. Let the fire of my altar never burn up. Let the fire of my altar never burn up. Let the fire of my altar never burn up. Make me a house of prayer. Lord, make me. Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. stand with you. If there's anybody else that is sick and you need a physical touch in your body, I want you to join us in prayer here in front in the name of the Lord. Come on, this is a house of prayer. This is a place where heaven's traffic comes into earth's location. Amen. This is a place where, where heaven's will gets imposed upon earth's reality. If you are trusting God for a miracle in your body, if you are trusting God for a miracle in your finances even, but we are specifically praying for physical healing. You, and we're going to pray a miracle for, for Jordan. Specifically, a request has come forth. And we're going to pray that God heals him of these, of these cancerous nodules in the name of the Lord. How many people believe God? Amen. Amen. How many people are people of faith? You know what James says? If any man is sick, let him call for the elders. And the elders are here today, right? I'm the senior elder of this house. And the Bible says, the prayer of faith. Everyone say the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith. Will not heal the sick. The prayer of faith will save the sick. Some sicknesses do not need healing. Some sicknesses need saving. Everyone say the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith. Heals the sick. Heals the sick. Saves the sick. Saves the sick. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So I want you just to, thanks Mark, come stand. I want you to just, as I pray, begin to stretch forth your hands. Everyone begin to stretch forth your hands towards these that are in front. Amen. We're going to pray prayers of faith that heal the sick in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for my mom here. I declare healed by the power and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, O oh God, the condition that afflicts her be healed, be rectified now in the name of Jesus. Heal her, Father. Make her every bit whole. Let strength and grace arise in her body now. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for Jordan. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I lay my hands on you. And I speak to this cancerous condition. These nodules will dry up by the power and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even now, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, I take authority over every spirit of cancer. And discomfort that is experiencing. And I pray, O oh God, that you, by the power that is yours, would heal it now in the name of Jesus. Cancer.
is not greater than your name. Your name is greater than any disease, than any sickness. So God, I just speak a word of healing. Thank you for your healing touch. Jordan, be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your healing, God, for your servants, Father, in the name of Jesus. And thank you, O oh God, that you will be touched by your power and by your might and by your authority now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, O oh God, that there's nothing too hard for the Lord. There's nothing too difficult for you. And even now, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for healing grace in the name of Jesus. Thank you for healing grace for Moira as well, Father. In the name of Jesus, make her every but whole in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Father. Thank you. Everyone, just lift up your hands and begin to thank God. Come on, just thank God. Just begin to thank God. You may go to your seats. God bless you. Just begin to thank God. Just begin to lift up your spirit in prayer before the Lord. And just thank God that you are healed in the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. There's nothing too difficult for our God. What seems impossible with men is possible with the Lord. When you pray, Jesus said, have faith in God. He said it very simply. When you pray, have faith in God. And we are those of faith. We are house of prayer. Come on, affirm it to your neighbor. Just greet a few people around you and say, we are house of prayer, house of power. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to break bread afterwards, if you don't mind. Amen. I'm going to ask Mark just to maybe come forward, and we'll receive the offering later as well. I want to pray again towards the end of the sermon just to provide us with the um, announcements. Thanks so much, Mark. Blessings. Morning, family. Trust you all well in the Lord. Amen. A warm welcome to each and every son of the house this morning, and especially those that are watching online, a very warm welcome to you. And you can feel the presence of the Lord in this place this morning. Amen. Do you agree with me, church? If not, then we're wasting our time. We're wasting our time. I mean, when you come in here, you've got to actually usher in the presence of God. The Spirit of God fills the environment first, and then each and every one of us. Amen. A warm welcome to the following people by name. Uh, this is Cindy Lee's aunt. That's uh, Stephanie Paul. Please stand. We want to give you a warm <laughs> Gate Ministries Durban welcome. Then this, these are the parents of Andre, Elias and Julia van Skalkbeek. Please stand. <laughs> Our mother dead. And then we have Atalia and Azaria. Please stand. Warm welcome. And then we have a family all the way from Botswana. Gaboroni, is that right? The sons of uh, Pastor Besaid Note. Please stand, the entire family, the Lapila family, OT and the family. A warm welcome to you. This is your father's house, so please, let's engage God and his is going to bless you in a mighty way. Amen. Okay, in terms of announcements this morning, uh, if you're looking for Mama, she's still in Cape Town. She will be back tonight. Uh, that, yeah, she just covered your prayers even as she flies back home th uh, this afternoon, this evening. And uh, announcements for the week on Wednesday will be our last uh, Zoom meeting for the house church group. And the focus of discussion will be what is presented by Papa this morning. So please make your notes, listen to the uh, uh, live stream and also the YouTube so that whatever stands out for you, whatever grabs your attention, you can present that on Wednesday. That will be the last house church meeting for the year. Then on Friday will be our normal prayer meeting from half past five till six o'clock. That's in the morning, Friday morning. Remember, Friday is a holiday. So uh, 
Some of us will tend to sleep in a bit late. You can join the prayer meeting and sleep after that. Okay, also Friday, being a public holiday, the youth will be having their final uh, breakup in-house meeting at this very same venue. And youth, that meeting starts from 3 o'clock. Because it's a holiday, 3 o'clock you guys will be gathering here till about 7, 8 o'clock. You're going to have an awesome time on Friday night, Friday evening. Then on Saturday, we have a free day. That's a public holiday, the 16th. But we meet again for our normal gathering on Sunday morning. And please, a reminder, the church times is quarter past eight. If you come in at nine o'clock, then you'll think the home call has begun. So it's going to be at quarter past eight at the very same venue. And we're trusting God's going to be uh, speaking to each and every one of us. Uh, how many of you are enjoying the book of Psalms? Today is chapter 19. I'm not sure if you've done that already, but when you get back home, chapter 19 tonight, today, and then chapter 20 tonight. Those are the two uh, scripture passages we got to read for today. So those of you that are visiting, we are busy studying the book of Psalms, and we're praying uh, on each scripture, on each passage of scripture, the, each chapter. That's what we are doing. That's going to take us till mid-Feb, mid-Feb. In terms of birthdays and anniversaries, there's no one that got married during the past week over the many years ago. But birthdays, we want to wish Gordon a very happy birthday. Gordon, God bless you. Also, Mika, Mika that celebrated his birthday in the course of the week, Mika says he needs a new dog for his birthday. The current one is too heavy, <laughs> too heavy to carry. And then also Kion, the Budai. The Budai family are not here this morning. They are away celebrating Kion's birthday. So he turned two today, turns two today. Okay, now we're going to be listening to the word of the Lord. And as you receive in your heart, say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Are we having Sunday school? Okay, the children will stay in, uh, with us for, for today. As, is, as indicated, um, Renee will be back this evening. She is just maximizing time with her grandchildren specifically and uh, her other children. Children often say, remember us. <laughs> so focus on the grandkids these days. Um, yeah, uh, Cindy and Liam got married last week. Um, it was a wonderful, wonderful, glorious celebration. We have Stephanie here, who is Cindy's aunt. Uh, Cindy, give me a sec. This thing fell. That's why it's making so much noise. Um, Cindy, Cindy's father, Stephanie, is the sister to Stephen. Okay, Stephen, Stephanie, you can see what the presents were thinking. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and she can tell you it was a wonderful, wonderful occasion, wonderful ceremony and reception. Uh, there was a lot of dignity, regality, poise at the ceremony. God's grace was fully abundant, and the reception was jovial. To say the least, it was a spirit of parting and joyfulness and exuberance it was really, really, really wonderful. Amen. So if we need to wish anybody happy wedding anniversary, it would be them. Happy one week <laughs> wedding anniversary. Okay, at least you covered one week. Amen. Renee comes back this evening at 8 o'clock, so I'll pick her up. And she'll be with us next week as well. Well... You know, we're going to continue. I'm so glad that Oteng is here. Oteng and uh, Kiri, and your family stand again. These are elders at Gate Gabaron with Quibus and Carla Besaidenot, some of their key leaders. And they're holidaying here in the north coast, the Mercy side somewhere. And uh, we are so glad that they're here uh, with us today. You'll probably see them next week as well. Uh, but Oteng is one of the key elders and leaders that Quibus and Kali rely a lot, upon a lot 
in terms of the management of the local house. So it's so great to have you with us. Please enjoy your time together. Amen. This mic fine now? Okay. We are dealing with prayer. Everyone say prayer. prayer. Um, a series on prayer, which is more than just a decision to prosecute a spiritual matter. It was a burden that God imposed upon my heart for us to find and draw near to God in a deeper place of, of prayer. I've been challenging you to spend at least an hour a day praying, at least 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the evening, or 20 minutes morning, noon, and at evening. And I want to encourage you, practice this, be diligent at it. You know what? It, it creates a, a rigor, it creates a, um, a methodology, a pattern that becomes a custom. And whatever becomes a custom becomes a habit, and through habits, character is formed. So while you might be in the struggle, so to speak, and some of you might find this difficult to establish the routine, I want to encourage you, be diligent, because um, through regularity and repetition of a thing, habits and customs are formed that ultimately become irretractable aspects of your character, your personality. Then after a period of doing this, you become known as a man and a woman of pray, one who knows how to, to pray and to consult God. So uh, Jeremy did an excellent um, job last week in, in teaching us the prayers of the righteous, how the righteous man prays. Who was blessed by that, by that teaching was really, I felt really encouraged and provoked and challenged as I listened last week Sunday afternoon to it. And uh, it, it carried a lot of grace and speakings of the Lord. This today represents the fourth session in the series. Today's topic is prayer propels purpose. Prayer pro propels divine purpose. Prayer pushes God's purpose. And I thought um, you would notice that while we are teaching, it's a balance between doctrine and prophetic uh, imperatives. I think most of our teachings go that way. I'm concerned that we understand the doctrine. That's why we're strongly didactic. We're teaching in our focus. But while we do that, we're always attuned in our spirits to ask God, what is the specific emphasis for the house uniquely every single week? So I'm going to attempt to do that again. I have some prophetic impression from a particular passage of Scripture. But before I get there, I want to lay out the doctrine. Simply because if we don't understand the doctrine, I'm a firm believer that doctrine dictates behavior. That doctrine, belief, informs behavior. So if you believe wrongly, you behave wrongly. Not so? So behavior must be rooted in belief. Doctrine is a dictator of decision, that's a dictator of habit, that's a dictator of priority, that's a dictator of emphasis. If you lack the emphasis, if you lack the priority, if you're making the wrong decisions, you must always go back to, what do I believe? Because what I believe, my doctrine, my doctrinal tenets will shape my life's activity, okay? My life's activity. And this is critical. So you would notice that in each session, while we're burdening you with the prophetic uh, emphasis of the Lord, our heart is always to at least teach doctrine so that that doctrine drives your decision to pray. Right? Um, Pastor Thamo always ch would challenge us. For example, he would say to us, Pastors, when you counsel your people and you give them a word of advice, and you say to them, I think you should do this. He always would challenge us and says, make sure your advice is rooted doctrinally. It's not what you think. It's what must emit from principles of God's word. And he says, you will always stay safe if counsel and advice is shaped by doctrine and not by your wishful thinking. So this is a fairly long study. And we'll probably do it in two or three parts, depending how fast we go. 
at least this specific focus on prayer propelling divine purpose. To propel means to push, means to facilitate. So please remember the topic, prayer is propelling purpose. If there is divine purpose, you need prayer to push it, you need prayer to propel it. Without the prayer, the purpose is not done, okay? And you have to, you have to understand this fully and you have to understand this doctrinally. Everyone say prayer is a mystery. Why pray if God is sovereign? Why must we pray if we serve a sovereign God that can do what He wants to, when He wants to, whenever He'd like to, without consulting anybody? He's God all by Himself. He's the great omnipotent one. He can, he can in a day decide, I will do X, Y, Z. I don't need to consult any human to get my business done. So there's that view of the sovereignty of God. So the debate theologically is, if He is sovereign and He has purpose, He has a will, He has intentions to be done on the earth, why can't He just go ahead and? and do it because he has the power he has the ability he is what he's called the lord god who is a descriptor in the logical language for the sovereignty of god the all knowing omniscient omnipotent power of god is the limitless one there's nothing outside the scope of his doing he can do anything all by himself he is god in his own unique category he is transcendent, that makes him God, right? He's above humanity, his ways are above our ways, his thoughts are above our thoughts. If he is like that, the big question is, why then must we pray to ask him to do what he already plans to do? Why must we provoke him through asking him what he exactly wants to do, right? Now, there's one view of sovereignty which I don't subscribe to, and the view is this, that God can do anything He wants to do without consulting humans or human cooperation. Right? Now, I don't subscribe to that. There's another view of sovereignty which I submit to, which is this. God is sovereign, and in His sovereignty, He has decided on a modus operandi to get things done on the earth. That methodology of modus operandi includes human cooperation, human compliance, and human obedience, without which he will not do anything. Even though he can, he will not. This view of sovereignty is a view of God's sovereignty that binds himself to human engagement. Now, that, this view of sovereignty, which I subscribe to, for me, is a far more glorious view of sovereignty than the first one, right? Because you must remember, you are not apart from God. You are a necessary part of God. You are not a part, like separate. You're not apart from Him. You are a part of Him, a very necessary part from Him. Because when you were made, He said, let us make man in our image and likeness every other created thing came out from god speaking let there be let there be let there be and there was but when it came to man god said let us make let, everyone say let us make so god the bible says did not speak man into existence the bible says god fashioned him right? and god fashioned the body of adam from the dust of the earth god did not speak but god breathed God breathed into Adam what? The breath of life. In other words, took from his constitution as spirit. God is a spirit and he put spirit in Adam. So, because the human was to be the representation, the visible representation of an invisible God. God lives in the realm called invisibility, right? When God made humans, they are to be the showpiece, the actual incarnation in flesh 
of everything that God stands for. So don't think of man as simply another piece of creation. He's the last item created, by the way. He was created at the end of day six. Animals were created the first part of the last day, day six. Man was created at the end of day, of, of day six. And that, um, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. What was created last was actually first on his mind, right? So God made everything. God set the stage. God set the arena and he put the ultimate intent of his creation on the scene of time. Now, he knew I need to create something visible that represents my invisibility. I'll make man in my own image and, and, and likeness, right? You must always remember, I want to stress this, you are not disparate from God, not disconnected. You're not another item of creation. Everything before you was made for you. God set, and you know what the Bible says? To, before he brings you on the scene of time, he says he made two things. Heaven and earth were made specifically to house his purposes in you. Let me just say this. I don't believe there's life on any other planet in the galaxy. It's my personal view. I believe the earth is the center of the entirety of all the created order. Right? And the earth has got no value outside of man being on it. The earth has no relevance outside of man living here. But God set an order. He said, before I make the earth, I'll make the heavens. Not so? Wasn't the heavens made before the earth? Yes. Right? The heavens were made before the earth. And God said, I will use the heavens as my throne. Not my home. My throne. Heaven is not God's home because heaven is a created reality. God existed before there was a heaven. Solomon had a view. He even said, even the highest of the heavens cannot contain you, O God. Right? So heaven wasn't meant to house God. All that God says about heaven is it would be my throne from which I would expedite purpose. What did he say? Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. I will walk. My feet will do its walking on the earth, but my mind, my, my will, my intent will be vested in a throne called the, the heavens. So when you were created, now when you pray, you always have this construct in your mind. I am the visible representation of an invisible God. He made two realms, one invisible heaven, we chose to rule from, and he put me in the visible location called earth. Heaven's will must be done in earth's reality, right? And he put me there to cooperate with his intention to bring all of heaven's will onto the earth. He is sovereign. Listen, please. He is sovereign. I'm not taking away from the omnipotence of God. But for me, I bow in greater awe and praise him for his sovereignty when I think about this fact, that he chose me to include me in his sovereignty. Um, one great man of God, I'm not sure who said it, said it like this. He said it like this. Without God, we cannot. But without us, God will not. Right? God wants to do stuff, but he will not unless he enlists humans into the program. You must always remember when you pray, you are God's son. He is your father. Everyone say, Papa. Papa. Right? And there's this invitation that he invites the son to be included in getting heaven's will done on the earth. And for me, prayer is an invitation to partner with the divine, right? Paul often uses the word fellow workers, not so? We are God's fellow workers. He had a view of the sovereignty of God that God can do and work anything he wants to do, but he called himself Titus and Timothy and others. He said, we are God's, not God's workers, say fellow workers. 
So he's working, he brings us alongside him. That makes his sovereignty far more glorious to me. It humbles me. Everyone say it humbles me. Next time you pray and you thank God for the fact that he's sovereign, lift your hands in awe and say, God, thank you. I'm a human, poor, old, frail, fragile me. You, the omnipotent one, will do nothing without me. You can't do anything without me, but you've elected to include me in your, in your purposes. Did you know God could have beamed down Jesus as a baby from heaven? Vroom. A light shining somewhere. Vroom. The baby comes, zoop, 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 zoop. And he could have been in the earth, not so. Or maybe better still, he could have beamed down Jesus as a 30-year-old male. Why go to all the processes of being born or being conceived in some virgin womb and let her be pregnant for nine months and go through processes of birth and teething, all the associated phases of, of child rearing, right? And all the phases of naughtiness that any typical Jewish boy would have gone through. Jesus would be running around there and he would need parental guidance. Why go through that? God needed human cooperation to develop his son. Without Mary and Joseph, Jesus would not have been the mature Jesus that he would have been. Right? It took parental, spiritual fathering, human agencies managing the eternal son of God to bring him to a place of maturity. Everyone say divine cooperation. So it's, 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 it's the divine cooperating with the human. The human must comply and, re, and respond to this. Okay? He could have done anything in bringing Jesus to the earth, but he chose to inform Mary. He said, Mary, come here. I want to include you in something. I'm sovereign. I can do this all by myself, but I need human cooperation. Joseph, come here. Who else was included? Zechariah, the priest at the time. Before I bring my son, I'll give your barren wife a child. Call his name John. He will go before my son. He will prepare the way. Not so. Shepherds in a field watching your flocks by night. I will inform you of something that's happening in the earth. God didn't need to, but he includes humans. Now, everyone do it like me. Say, do this. Say, <laughs> maybe talk to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you included. He included. God's a sovereign God, but he takes humans and he says, I'll take the human and I include the human. That makes for me his sovereignty far more glorious, right? Um, far, more, far more awe-inspiring. Tell someone to be his sovereign. He is sovereign. He truly is. God could have wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah without telling anybody. Not so. Before he did that, his protocol, everyone say his protocol. His modus operandi, he says, he himself said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And he goes to Abraham first and he informs Abraham, I'm about to destroy these cities. Abraham responds how? With prayer. No, sir. Whenever God informs the human of his will, the expectation from God in the human is that the human will start the activity of praying regarding that revealed will. The will is not simply done. The purpose is not simply secured without some man or woman praying. Prayer propels purpose. God informs Abraham to incite intercession in Abraham. The information of God to you is to incite intercession in you. Whenever you get a revelation of God and God reveals stuff to be done, the revelation of what He is going to do doesn't absolve you from responsibility. You don't say, wow, I got a nice prophecy. Thank you, Lord. Let me sit back and see it happen. No. When God informs you, God's expectation of you is that you adopt the role of partnership by prayer. A fellow worker, a sovereign God will do nothing until he enlists you, at least inform you, provoke you to cooperate with him so that you can pray in reference to his revealed purposes. Tell someone without God, we cannot. 
But without us, God will not. Right? Without God, we cannot do anything without Him. But He, without us, He will not. Not that He cannot. He can do anything, but He's chosen not to because He sees you not as separate from Him, but as a necessary part of Him. Tell your neighbor, I'm a part of Him. So next time, maybe tonight when you pray, come to God. Say, I thank you for your sovereignty. But I thank you that you've enlisted my cooperation. What a privilege it is to, because it's not like he's transcendent. He's also imminent. There's two theological words that are polars, polar opposites. The one is transcendence and the one is imminence. Transcendent is when God is far away, far above that makes him God all by himself. He's above the earth, above humans, set apart in his own category. Everyone say transcendent. But there's another theological concept called imminent. The imminence of God is not a contradiction of his transcendence. Imminence means a near God. He's right here with us. He's not a faraway God. He's a very near God, right? And in his imminence, his transcendence is brought closer and you get, wow, God, you want to do this? But you've included me in the program. And then when you get a revelation of it, say, now I need to pray. Because not only did you decide what to do, you decided you will not do it without me. So I will at least partner with you by saying, let your will be done on earth as it's done where? As it's done in the, the heavens. Right? This for me fuels my prayer life. That's this for me that will provoke me to get up early on a Friday morning to come to the place of prayer. I'm not bound by the, the weakness of my body or the need to sleep as much as I am propelled by a sovereign God. I said, Randolph Iko, I want you to partner with me. Let's work together to get the business done. The least thing you can do, Randolph, is to pray is to pray that the will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, I want to stress, tell someone God needs your compliance. God needs your compliance. God sent 12 spies to spy out the promised land, not so? Under Joshua's leadership. Before they could possess the land, he sent 12 to spy out the land. How many tribes, how many spies came back with a false report, negative report? Ten said, we cannot do it. There's giants in the land. Not so. How many, how many spies came back with a good report? Say, we can do this. Two, Joshua and Caleb. Do you know God's hands were bound? Even though he could have just wiped out everybody in the land? God did not veto the unwillingness of the ten spies. God did not step in a transcendent, sovereign, or power and say, listen here, you guys step aside. This is my program. You two, let's go. God was bound by decisions that, and by the way, those 10 spies were not just 10 ordinary men from Israel. All the spies were the leaders from each tribe. So they had rank, they had or authority, and God respected their unwilling, fearful disobedience. See, if that's the position... I'll defer the program for 40 years. I'll wait for another generation to arise that can cooperate with me. You see, he's sovereign. He can do what he wants to, when he wants to. But he waits for faith. He waits for obedience. He waits for compliance. Tell someone, God is waiting for you. And I want to encourage you. You see, God could have vetoed the unwillingness to enter. But he did not. Or not to enter. But he did not. He said... My, well, I can do what I want to, when I want to. I can consult nobody. I'm transcendent. I'm God all by myself. But I work by protocol. I'm a God. I have a specific modus operandi. I, will, I need human compliance, human cooperation to effect my purposes in the earth. And God had to defer the program to 40 years later. In fact, God learned. Not that he needs to learn anything. Because 40 years later, how many spies he sent in to spy out Jericho? Only two. Didn't send all 12. You know, I'm not taking another chance for these. <laughs> I'm sending two, which is the power of agreement, the power of witness. Okay? And 
They came back with a report. And based upon what Rahab the harlot who housed him told the two spies, they said, the people in the city are quaking because of us. And there were, remember the view 40 years ago was that we are fearful, they're bigger than us, right? There was fear, but 40 years later, there was human cooperation. There was human compliance to divine initiatives. And I want to encourage all of you, do not fear what you are trusting God to enter into. Do not fear what God is leading you into. Uh, do not fear the giants. Because if you submit to a negative mindset and report in this season, God says, no problem, I'll simply wait for you to pass away. <laughs> and i got time, you don't have. God lives in eternity. God says, I'll wait 40 years if I have to. Let this whole generation die in the wilderness. That's what he said. They will fall in the wilderness. And only those 20 years and under survived not so. And a new breed, a new breed, 40 years later, was eligible. God preserved only two people, Joshua and Caleb. They ended. Think about it. Only two of the original group that left Egypt entered the Canaan because of their, their spirit. And I'm just getting the prophetic impression here today, brethren. There's so much in the balance for us right now for you to enter into. Don't allow fear, intimidation to, to inhibit and to dull a confidence in you when you pray that, God, we can do this thing. This will can be done, God. In your prayer, it will manifest as confidence. Everyone say confidence. I'll speak to this in a moment. It will manifest. In fact, let's go there right now. 1 John 5, 14 says this. This is the confidence we have before Him. 1 John 5, 14. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Now, and then verse 15, and we know that he hears us in whatsoever we ask. We know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Now look at the previous verse again. I want to just emphasize three phrases. Look, if everyone say this, say we ask. Right? Everyone say we have. The language that John used says, we have, and he says, we, we, we ask, right? Now say this, he hears. He hears. I like these short phrases, you know. It's like if you put them in ranking, it's, it's we ask, he hears, we have. Tell, repeat this after me, say, we ask, we ask. He, hears, he hears, we have, right? And the Apostle John says, you can live like this in prayer. When you ask, he hears, you have, and you, he calls it confidence. Everyone say confidence, right? The word in the Greek is, you know this word, I've used it often in various teachings. It's pahisia. Pahisia means freedom in speaking, unreserved speech. Unreserved speech. It's not tempered speech. It's bold. It, it, it's not edited speech. You can speak your mind. You can speak plainly. You can speak boldly. It, is, it actually means free and fearless speech. Cheerful courage or bold assurance. Repeat this after me. Say, Pahisia. Now say it like, like it's a confident sounding word. Say, Pahisia. Anyone wants a name for a girl? Maybe that's a good one. What's the name of your child? Pahisia. Pahisia, come hither. <laughs> and people ask you, what on earth? Where does this name come from? You tell them it's a Greek term. It means confidence. Confidence of the one who prays. Pahisia. Maybe I'm serious. Some of you need to fall pregnant and just bring forth a pahisia. Or take maybe you. I don't know sure. Or your wife. <laughs> But you know the word paisia, like the Greek meaning suggests, it's when you stand and you're bold in your speech, unreserved, confident, fully assured. And what gives you, what gives prayer confidence? 
What gives prayer confidence is knowledge of His will. Look at the text again. Everyone say knowledge of His will. Because John said, this is the confidence which we have before Him, that if we ask, it's not just blanket asking, it's asking what, how? According to His will that He hears us. And then He says, if we know, in verse 15, that He hears us, that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have. Everyone say we have. We have the requests which we have asked of him. The imperative here is you got to know the will. Not so? Let thy will be done on earth as it's done in, in heaven. The will is established in heaven. The will is decided in heaven. The will is affirmed in heaven. The will is dictated to by heaven. Earth doesn't decide the will. Heaven does. Earth simply recognizes what the will of God in heaven is, and earth prays it into being. When Jesus said to, uh, to when the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. He said, pray like this. Our Father, which art in, you know, come on, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The request was, teach us to pray. So Jesus said, okay guys, let me teach you the technology of prayer. The technology of prayer has got to do with a will your Father has in heaven. When you pray, you are the intermediary, you are the interface to see heaven's will done in earth's reality, right? Always, when you pray tonight, always have this picture in your mind of a sovereign God that can do whatever He chooses when He wants to without consulting humans, but He's chosen in sovereignty to include you, His representation made in His image and likeness that without you, your partnership, your compliance, your willing cooperation, He will not do anything outside of you because you are not you are an extension of Him. Tell your neighbor you're an extension of Him. So the issue around prayer is purpose. The issue around prayer is God's business. The issue concerning prayer is divine will. When you pray, your priority is get divine will done. And so my, in my humanness, I partner with an invisible God who is spirit and my job my role my part in this is absolutely indispensable to the thing being done again i want to stress without god we what did i say it? without god or without god we cannot but without us god will not without us god will not in john for in John 11 at Lazarus's tomb, before Jesus lays, raised Lazarus from the dead, and he said, Lazarus, come. For not so, remember? In verse 41, he says, the Bible says this, that he moved the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes and said this. Now, think about this. Jesus is about to, is about to raise Lazarus from the, from the dead, right? But before he does that, now, everyone say, that's the Father's will. That's the Father's will. Jesus did nothing unless what He did was the Father's will. Even at one stage, they said to Him, you do great works. He says, these works are not mine, but they're the works of my Father. Other times, they praised Him for a great authoritative teaching. He said, this doctrine, He said, is not my own, but it's the teaching or the doctrine of my, of my Father who, who sent me. So He knows what is about to do and the father is going to do in and through him so that he moved the stone blocking the entrance to the tomb where Lazarus was buried Jesus raised his eyes and said father I thank you you have heard me what does that presuppose in what mode is Jesus's mind he's in prayer mode not so He's already consulted his father about raising Lazarus from the dead. 
And I, and I can picture, though the, the text doesn't say it, there's no record of the prayer. He just says, I thank you, you have already heard me. I'm going to do something great here, but this is nothing more than heaven's will being done on the earth. And he lifted up his voice to his father. He says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. This is praying without praying. This is when you're so baptized in prayer. You can engage in life, in the normality of life, without pausing to pray, but having prayed. Are you understand what I'm saying? If you're taking notes, Nehemiah chapter 2 is a lovely corroborating scripture. Cross-reference, Nehemiah chapter 2. Because when Nehemiah was praying for the king to release him from Babylon to rebuild the walls, remember? Right? And um, Nehemiah, it, it says there, the king asked him, he was praying for four months. Everyone say four months. He fasted and prayed for four months, and he had the boldness to come to the king to ask for a leave of absence from the king's court. He was the king's cupbearer. And um, the king uh, said, what do you want? What can I do for you? Why are you so sad? Right? And then the text says, it says, so I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, give me a leave of absence. Now, it's not like the king asked him, Nehemiah, what do you want? It's not like he said to the king, give me five minutes, let me go pray. Come back. Oh, I want to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. No. It's like when the king said, what do you want? Nehemiah said, I want to go. But in between the king's question and his answer, there's a little verse there where Nehemiah says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. Right? It's not like he went to pray. Even when a question is asked without losing a second between the posed question and his answer, there was prayer ushered. That's when, that's why I say, keep to the rigor, keep to the rigor. Everyone say, keep to the rigor. It says, don't miss the time. Pray one hour a day, and you will find sometimes in life, you'll be at school, right? Or at your workplace. And stuff can be happening in the moment, moments in time, but prayer is bouncing off your spirit back and forth between heaven and earth. And they will not know you have prayed, yet you are baptized in prayer. Right? And Jesus, Jesus exudes this. Here's the text. Thank you, uh, Gary. The king said to me, what is your request? In fact, just read. Come on, let's just read the whole chapter here. <laughs> not the whole chapter, just the previous <laughs> verses. Now some of you are getting worried now. <laughs> hey, this is a word church. <laughs> okay. Right? Came about in the month of Nisan. Ever wonder where the group Nisan got their name from? 20th year of the king of Artaxerxes, that wine was before him. I took up the wine and I gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. In fact, it was illegal for a wine carrier, a wine dispenser, um, to be sad in the presence of a king. And he came in there breaking. He was so uh, distressed by the state of Jerusalem, its broken walls, its burnt gates. So he said, the king says, What's happening here? You're breaking protocol. Why are you sad in my presence? The king said to me, why is your face sad as though you are sick? This is nothing. Even the king discerned. Your heart is sad. Oh, then he says, I was very much afraid. Because he knew the king could order his death. So I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate? And its gates have been consumed with fire. Right? Then the question. The king said to me, so what, is, what do you want? What is your request? So I pray to the God of heaven. Right? And then he says in verse 5, he, he lays it out. I said to the king, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Can you see this? Question posed and answer given, and there's a short verse there. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Tell someone, pray without praying. First Thessalonians 5, I think 19 says, pray without ceasing. It's like when your spirit is in constant. How many of you are finding this even in this time? It's not like you're observing your 30 minutes in the morning and your 30 minutes. Yes, you must do that. I'm not saying no, don't not do that. But even in the course of the day, it's like you're in constant conversations with God. Anybody experiencing that? It's like you move, your spirit is moving backward and forth with, with conversations with God. 
That is what it's all about. It's to develop a spirit so sensitive to the Lord. I, I was in conversations with a specific pastor and he was telling me some terrible things he's going through and he's expecting an answer from me and sometimes even in a counseling situation I don't know what to say but in my mind is Lord give me the words it's like prayers are, prayers are always going back and forth between heaven and and earth Amos 3 and verse 7 quickly Amos 3 and verse 7 Amos 3 and verse 7 Surely the Lord God does nothing unless, everyone say unless. unless. Now let me ask you, can God do anything? Yes. yes. But this verse, this verse says, He does nothing until something else help, happens. He does nothing unless He reveals His secret counsel to His servants, the, the prophets. So you get the divine, you get the human, they are prophets. God says, I cannot do anything here until a prophetic people arise that I can inform them of what I need to do. I will do nothing even though I'm sovereign. In fact, the NLT says it like this. The NLT says it, surely, indeed, the sovereign Lord, actually uses the word sovereign, the sovereign Lord never does anything until he reveals his plans to his servants, the prophets. And the revelation to prophetic people is so that they will pray and partner with God in prayer what God intends to do. I want to read you a short extract from Judson Cornwall's book, Praying the Scriptures. I shared the link to Amazon on the church WhatsApp group and I encouraged you to buy it. Many of you have bought it. Some of you actually sent me pics um, of, on your devices. It's a most fantastic book on prayer. If you haven't bought it yet, please buy it. It's very cheap. It's a nice read. It's called Understanding the Scriptures by Judson Cornwall. In fact, for those of you watching online, I'll put it in the descriptor of the video here below. He said this. Listen. God has limited His actions to our praying. It's an amazing statement. God has limited His actions to our praying. While it is true, and he quotes, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets, Amos 3, 7. God's prophets must first be praying people. This is a prophetic house, not so? Remember, Prophet Quirbus came and he, and, and he labored this. We, and even Prophet Sean Blicknot echoed the same sentiments. If we are going to develop prophetic capacity, we are got to develop very, very strong prayer power. Because a praying people are a strongly prophetic group. And if you are a prophetic group, God can look at this group and say, I want to do business in the earth, but I need to share with some prophetic people. I will do nothing unless I first reveal secrets to them can do nothing, but they must respond. The most ideal response from my people would be one of prayer. Then he continues, As with Abraham, of whom God said, Surely I hide from, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Genesis 18, 17. And these statements impacted me. His next two phrases. He said, God reveals his will to inspire our intercession for God will not do apart from intercession what he has promised to do by it I let that statement sink into your spirit I want to repeat it again listen carefully God will God will not do apart from intercession what he has promised to do by it prayer is the vital link he said that releases God's plans into life's programs. Prayer is the vital link that releases God's plans into life's programs. Who wants a release of divine plans into human programs? I'm sure we all do. God's saying the missing aspect is pray. When you pray, let me just say this, apostolic doctrine 
will reveal the will of God. The word reveals the will. That's why the reading of the Psalms is so important in the season. You want a revelation of God's will for any circumstance? Yes, I believe you can sense it by prophecy and you can sense it by spirit discernment. But more than anything, God's word informs His will. That's why Judson wrote that book, Understand, is, it's called Praying the Scriptures. And his view is, if you are going to pray the will, and if you have confidence because you asked, right? He hears, you have, this is the confidence that you have, that if you ask anything according to His will, that He hears you and you have the request for whatever you have asked. He says, that's why we need the Scriptures to pray them because the scriptures are the most accurate depiction of the, the will of God. Right? You cannot go wrong in praying the Bible, in using verses as the basis to launch your prayers from. Because if anything, God respects His word, not so. And His word, that's why this is a word church, but it's a praying church. It's an apostolic church, but it's a prophetic church too. Right? The apostolic doctrine is necessary. Acts 2.42, quickly, Gary, what does it say? They continued how? Everyone say steadfastly. Some versions say continually. In ASB says, they were continually devoting themselves to four things. Number one, apostolic, teaching or doctrine. Number two, fellowship. Number three, breaking of prayer. And number four, prayer. You see, prayer is fourth on the list, but teaching is first. Because if you don't know the doctrine, you will pray wrongly. Right? So the doctrine informs you of the will. And prayer must echo that. Just by the way, in Acts, I don't know, 15 or 16. Remember Paul had a vision to go to Macedonia. He saw in a vision a man from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. Remember that incident? And when he went there together with Luke, uh, Silas and others, they came to a river and they saw a group of women praying. Remember? Praying by the river. Like an intercessory group of ladies praying. And the Bible says, and Paul opened his mouth and taught. Right? Then the Bible says, and the Lord opened the heart of Lydia, who seems to be a principal person in the group. She was an extremely successful businesswoman. Right? Extremely successful businesswoman and a praying person with other ladies. And the Bible says, as Paul spoke, the Lord opened the heart of Lydia to receive um, the words of, of Paul. Is it verse 14? Right? A woman named Lydia of the city of Thyatira, seller of purple fabrics. So who's a clientele if she's selling purple fa fabrics? Who buys purple? Kings. Highly successful. But you see, there's no contradiction between being highly successful in terms of your prosperity and business and being a worshiper of God. This Lydia, everyone say bending. Say travailing. travailing. Say firebrand. firebrand. Three things that Lydia means. Bending. Travailing. She's a, she's a woman of prayer. She travails. But her name also means firebrand. Right? Let the fire of my altar never burn out. We just say, right? Get some vav of woman in your prayer. On fire, you know? Hallelujah. Say, everyone say some fire. We're calling this the spirit of prayer, not so? And Lydia, bending, firebrand, one who travails. She's a travailer. She's a worshiper of God, and she was listening. Don't just sell fine purple fabrics. Also listen to God's word while you do. Huh? Don't just be so fixated on prayer and intercession that you neglect doctrine. I have seen especially prayer groups that are largely women-based, suffer greatly in terms of marriages, all sorts of ills befall them. You know why? Because you expose yourself by engaging in, in so-called spiritual warfare, and you are uncovered, and you become an easy target for the devil. We are not discounting prayer groups or women prayer groups, not at all. Everyone say, we need more prayer. But women are not called to pray. All of us are called to pray. 
We must break the mold that only women are called to pray and only women have prayer power. If you're sitting next to a man, say, you, brother, are called to pray. <laughs> you know, in, in Christendom, we've grown up with certain things over time, and we think they are biblical, but there's no biblical basis that only women are intercessors. None at all. In fact, I can quote a lot of verses where the Paul would say, men ought to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubt. I can quote you Luke 18 verse 1, men ought always to pray and not to, to faint. Paul said, I would that men everywhere pray. Tell your neighbor, it's for all of us. Oh my God, my time is, I'm fighting Eskom here. Watch carefully, listen. So there's this group of women praying. Now, please don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't leave the building and saying Randolph is against women intercessory. I'm not, I'm not against it. But if it is to be, it must be covered by apostolic authority. Right? There must be no arrogance in the group. I've seen too much arrogance in such groups. Right? No arrogance. There must be humility. And you pray doctrine. You pray the will of the, you pray the will of the Lord. So here's a group. And a worship of God was listening, Lydia. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things of Paul. Praise God. No Lord shedding breath, and I'll be here for the next hour. <laughs> right? Everyone say the Lord opened her heart to apostolic doctrine. Now, the Bible says, look at the next verse. I won't go through the entire thing. I didn't plan this, not part of my notes, but we're here now. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged Paul and others, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. Paul used Lydia's house. Everyone say Lydia's house. Lydia's. A lot of churches named like this. You search at churches' names, Lydia's house. Uh, a lot of businesses named Lydia's house. The shepherds in Washington, D.C., Eugene and Pratis Shepherd, was deceased now. The whole organization, community project is called Lydia's House. Lydia's House contextually was used as a basis for Paul to do apostolic work in the city of Philippi. But I just think it's so uncanny that Paul came to a praying group. Paul did not come to a prayerless people. And all he did, he took the prayers and he simply tweaked it apostolically. Okay? He didn't go to a non-praying group of women. He came to a praying group of women. Everyone say a praying people. You see, prayer is vital to push purpose. The purpose of God in Philippi would not have been ideally secured if Paul did not come to that environment where prayer power is so strong. The prayer power of Philippi is notable. You know they would land up in jail, Paul and Silas at Philippi, for preaching. At midnight, they would raise their voices and sing and pray to God. And the prison doors were swung wide open. The prison itself was, was, was broken and they were set free. Amen. And I want to encourage you, if God wants to do his business on the earth, he looks for a praying company. I look for a man to stand in the gap. You know, they're all... I figure where the text is. I'll look for it later and share it on the church group with you. The verse that says, I looked for a man to stand in the gap. That, I think, is not an individual man, but a corporate man, a group of people, a praying church to stand in the gap. What is the gap? The gap is to bridge heaven and earth. The gap is heaven as a will, all need, earth needs it to be done. The gap is man must step in and bridge heaven's will with earth's reality. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Gary's on the board today. <laughs> Ezekiel 22 and verse 30, I search for a man among them who will build up the wall and stand in the gap before me of the land so that I would not destroy it, but I found none. Okay? I'll speak to this verse when I do a special session on watchmen. Watchmen, what of the night? Right? I want to encourage you, have the courage to pray. Everyone say courage to pray heaven's will. Let me, let me end with this. I'll just take another 10 minutes and then we'll, we'll be done. But I'm going to skip a whole lot of, I have 15 examples here of the same principle over and over and over again 
Heaven has a will. God will not do it until someone prays it. Very simple. Heaven has a will. In fact, a lot of heaven's intentions go suspended because of prayerlessness on the earth. May it never be said of you, you have not because you ask not. You did not enter it because you did not pray it through sufficiently. How many people believe that we're going to buy a building suit for the church? How many of you are praying daily around this? Eh? I would encourage you every day, bring this before the Lord. Okay? Because heaven has a wall, it has been revealed. Now, as we engage and the group has been formed, there's a separate WhatsApp group. In fact, I'm seeing a property this afternoon here on the bluff, um, just to check it out. So it's, it's, it's essential that while we engage in finding properties, that we lace it with much prayer, that heaven's will be done on the, on the earth. See if I must see the property this week as well in, in Pine Town. Let me close with this. Tell someone he said he's closing. <laughs> this, this is, I would, you know, this is like the last item in the note. And then I got up very early. I got no wife, what else to do? <laughs> I got up very early. I'm flipping through the notes and reviewing. What shall we do? What shall we focus? What's the emphasis? And I was actually lost for an emphasis at the Lord. Well, let me just start at the beginning and see what happens. And then, just before I left home, um, I read through the whole chapter. Please write this down. I would like this chapter, more than anything I've said today, for you to focus in your house church meetings on Wednesday. It's Second Samuel chapter 7. It's not a long chapter, about 27 or 30 verses or so. But I'm not going to read the entire chapter now. I'll paraphrase it for you. Pick up on one or two verses because... As I read this verse, this chapter in the week, God really, God really spoke to my heart. So, here's the gist of the chapter in a nutshell. David wanted to build God a house. And he said, I dwell personally in a house of cedar. But my God is dwelling in a tent. Remember, David's tabernacle was unlike the tabernacle of Moses. When David moved the Ark of the Covenant... He did not put it back in the traditional structure that Moses would have, outer courts, inner courts, holies of holies, right? David was very bold. He simply pitched a tent, one, one room tent, and he put the ark there, that's all, right? And the Bible says God is restoring the tabernacle of David, not Moses, in the last day. There's a whole lot of principles attendant with that we can't speak to here now, but his concern was because the Ark of the Covenant to him represented the glory of God, the presence of God, the technology of a host of spiritual things as indicated in the, the, the tablets of stone, the pot of manna that was in there, and Aaron's rod that budded. You know, those three items were in the Ark, and they all speak to specific technology. I won't have time to go there now, but just, just factor this. God was in a tent in David's time. David's heart, when he looks at his own personal house that he dwells in, magnificent thing of cedar, his concern is, I can't dwell like this when my God is in a tent. So he says, I will build my God a house. He wants to build a magnificent physical structure. Then God says to him, in fact, can we just read it quickly? Because I don't want to miss the spirit of the text. It came about now when the king lived in his house that the Lord God had given him rest from every side from all his enemies. The king said to Nathan, Nathan is the prophet, See now, I, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within ten curtains. Nathan said to the king, Go do what is in your heart or your mind, for the Lord is with you. Nathan gives him the green light, Go and build God something. But the same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan and said, Go say to my servant David, thus says the Lord, Are you the one that should build a house, build me a house to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle, the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness. 
Whenever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribes of Israel, which I, command, I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now God's having this conversation with David through Nathan. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you, David, from the pasture, from following sheep, to be a ruler of my people Israel. Tell your neighbor, he brought you too from a mighty long way. <laughs> May we sing the song? Who's grateful for the work of God from where he took you? And yet God reminds David, listen guy, you were a shepherd looking after smelly sheep. I took you from looking after sheep to being king. I did that, God says. I've been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies before you and I will make you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Huh? I will also appoint a place for my people, and I will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. Nor will the wicked afflict them anymore as in former times or formerly. Even from the day that I commanded judges, remember the book of Judges? In that era, God referenced it from, I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies, David. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make you or will make a house for? Is that God saying, you want to build me a house? Like, a, build me a house? You know, like I can see like, I mean, please, I'm not being disrespectful. It's like, you want to build me something? No, I'll build you something. How can you build me, but I will build you a house? Everyone say oiko, or say bayith. Oikos is the Greek, bayith is the Hebrew. In other words, the house, the word house here is a legacy. Everyone say legacy. God is not saying, I'm going to build you a physical house. God is saying, I'm going to build you a lineage, David. I'm going to build you a legacy. There will sons come out of your loins, and never will you lack a king to rule in Judah that will come from your line. In fact, if you know your Bible, Jesus would come as the last king from the line of David. And even the book of Revelation says that Jesus sits on the throne of David. And God says, I'm going to build you something here, David, a legacy, a house of perpetuity. Will, an endless generation will never pass away. You want to build me something? Guess what? I will build you something. Right? It's built for built. <laughs> I just love this. You know, when I read this, I like chuckle. It's like, God, you want to build me something? Okay, no, watch here, David. Watch this space. I will build you a house, a lineage, a destiny, a legacy. Look at verse 12 and read on. Watch. When your days are complete, in other words, when you're about to pig off and die, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you. We know that to be Solomon. Who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house for my name. Remember Solomon built the temple. Who had the idea? David had the idea. His son would bring it into fruition. It actually is never called David's house. It's always called Solomon's temple in the Bible. But the, 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 the vision was the fathers, the son brought it to pass. I have a vision that we buy a church building. Hopefully you sons can bring it to pass. <laughs> okay. Right. I will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Right. I love God's words here to Solomon through this prophecy. I will be a father to him. Don't worry, David. I'll be a father to him. He will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men. And the strokes of the sons of men. Verse 15. But my loving kindness will not depart from him. Even when he sins. As I took it away from Saul. When I removed. Whom I removed before you. Verse 16. Watch this. Your house and your kingdom will endure before me forever. You know it's a very powerful statement this. When God does something in one man. And his whole generation gets blessed after him despite their issues. Now tell someone, you are that man. I know, I pray for my children every day before the Lord. God knows my heart. 
and my grandsons, right? Um, I know they will be blessed even up to the seventh generation. And I want to encourage you, stand in this power that when God sees you as one man, He sees your generation. I've taught you this before, right? Don't leave it, don't leave them to the element of this world um, by default for them to, to come or, or to make or, or not to make a success of things. Your throne will be established forever. Verse 17. We're about to close. In accordance with all these words and vision, so Nathan spoke to David. So the prophet, everyone say, heaven's will is declared. Will. Say, heaven's will is revealed. Will. There's a sovereignty of God, but it requires human cooperation in David. So what David turns to the Lord. I love what it says. David, the king, went in and he sat. He hears all this technology, eh? Hearing all this info, the response of the Davidic man is, he goes in and he sits before God. And he said, who am I? I'm sure you've prayed this prayer many times. Who am I, Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? Who is grateful for the blessing of the Lord on your house up to this point? And sometimes I have to pinch myself, God, what on earth did I do to deserve such kindness and goodness? Right? Who am I? I said to Liam in his speech at his wedding that um, because of the caliber of son he is, that I feel privileged to be his father. It's like, what did I do to deserve such goodness in a son? You know, that kind of thing. David feels something very similar here. Gets all this intel from, from God and then he says, who am I? What is my house that you've been so good to us, God? Verse 19. Yet this was insignificant in your eyes. The word insignificant means, in other versions, a small thing. Now there was nothing for you to do, God. It's a light thing. Yet this was insignificant in your eyes, Lord God, for you have spoken also of the house of your servant concerning the distant future. Not only have you been kind to me now, God, you're talking about generations and descendants. And if he, had, he was a prophet, by the way, Acts chapter 2 identifies David as a prophet. So he must have seen the, the ultimate king, Jesus, king of kings, lord and lords, are going to issue forth from my dynasty. Right? Even the distant future. And this is the custom of man, O oh God. Right? But you have done it. Again, what more can David say to you? Because remember this man, David, committed adultery. This man was a murderer. This man knows the mercy of God. If anyone was ineligible, it would have been David. But he knows he's been the recipient of great mercy. If anyone could have lost destiny, it would have been David. But David wrote, great is your mercy toward me. Right? Who's grateful that God did not judge you after your sins? I'm forever grateful. And I just think this house must come to the Lord this week and say, God, who are we? That you have been so good to us, despite our humanity, our failures, our weaknesses, yet you're talking things to us prophetically now, and not just now, of things in the, in the future. We are so ineligible, so uh, uh, unworthy, but yet you speak these things. And I think God's goodness overwhelms David here. He says, who am I? What more can I say? Have you ever got to this point in prayer? Lord, I, don't, I can't even say anything right now. What more can I say? You've been so good. For you know your servant. It's like you know me, God. You know what you're dealing with here. If any, nothing is hidden from you. You know me. You know your servant, Lord God. Verse 21. For the sake, I love this. Everyone say, for the sake of your word. The word reveals the will. For the sake of your word. And according to your own heart, you sovereign God, you have done all this greatness and you let your servant know the Lord God will do nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants. David knows this. He says, you let me in. You let me know. And verse 22, watch. And what nation, he speaks about, his mind is cast to Israel now. What nation on earth is like your people, Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people to make a name for himself and to do a great thing? 
for you and awesome things for your land before your people whom you have redeemed for yourself from Egypt, from nations and their gods. Who's like Israel, he says? Who's like your people? For you have established yourself, your people, Israel, as your own people forever. And you, Lord God, have become their God. Right? So he praises the heritage of the Lord and the stature of God's people. Verse 25. Now, therefore, now look at David's. Everyone say, confidence. confidence. Say, pahisia. Say, boldness in speaking. Unreserved, he's like armed now with, I don't know, what is the old Zulu word my mom used to say? It's not in Kani. In Kani is like arrogance. What? It's like he's, he's bold, right? Now, therefore, watch his prayer. Oh, Lord God, the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and his house, confirm it forever. Just do what you've spoken. Everyone say human cooperation. There's now David realizing, I can't just, this doesn't absolve me not to pray. Now I sit before the Lord my God. I thank him and I pray it through. You have done as you have spoken. Verse 26. Verse 27 is what I really want to get to, but you have to read all of this to get there. Right, verse 26, watch. That your name might be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is God over Israel. And may the house of your servant David be established for ever. Is this wishful thinking he's praying? No, he's praying what? He's praying the will of? Of God. He said, just do it then. If that's your intention for me, I agree. I agree with heaven's intent. Let's do it. Right? Verse 27. For you, Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, have made a revelation to your servant. You know this, this phrase in the original Hebrew, you've made a revelation. Check it out for those of you who are word scholars. It means to uncover the ear. David saying, you've uncovered my ear. You've unblocked my ear. And you said, I will build you a house. I just love this last phrase. Therefore, everyone say therefore. Your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. The word courage here literally means boldness. If you read in the Old King James, it's, it reads like this, the servant has found it in his heart to pray for you. And when I, when I thought about this, you know, there's many other principles we can, we can glean from this. I want to read the same verse in the NLT. O Lord God of the armies of heaven, the God of Israel, I have been bold enough to pray this prayer before you. Because you have revealed all this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house, a dynasty of kings. Now, I want to ask you, this week, have a courage to pray. David steps up and he says, your servant has the courage to pray before you. I have the courage to pray. Everyone say the courage to pray. I can stand before you in Pahisia, O God, and boldly declare your intent because a revelation has come to me. All I'm doing is I'm partnering with you in prayer. So let this be done. Now, God, establish the dynasty of your servant, King David, as king forever. I dare you. I mean this seriously. I dare you to pray boldly this week. I dare you to pray courageously this week. I dare you to come before God, not hit and run. I dare you to come before God in confidence, saying, God, your servant, talk to him. Say, God, Father, your servant, Randolph Barnwell, has found courage to pray this prayer before you because I'm literally praying your word back to you. You've said this either by prophecy or by revelation from the written text. I'm praying this word back to you. Surely it will come to pass. This is the confidence I have that if I ask anything according to your will, you hear me. I have the petitions or the requests that I've desired of you. I ask you hear and I have. In fact, you know the text in John 11 we read concerning Jesus? We said, Father, I, I thank you, you hear me. 
always that you have heard me in the next verse he said and by the way father I'm paraphrasing Jesus by the way father every time I pray you always hear me it's like this is nothing out of the ordinary so what I it's how we it's how we roll <laughs> tell someone how you're rolling with God <laughs> Jesus Jesus is saying to his father this is our modus operandi every time I call you you hear right? every time I call you engage God I just feel now I want to challenge you for this week are there any outstanding matters that need fulfillment in your life is there anything that you know is God's will and you know it either by prophecy or you know it by principle from God's word right that this should be taking place in my life this chapter has become just in the past three or four days I've been reading it daily such a revelation to me David's prayerful response to heaven's intentions revealed to him through a prophet Nathan it says and David came and sat before the Lord says, I have the courage I have the boldness it's in my heart to release these words now father you simply do what you have promised to do because you've opened and uncovered my ears to divine revelation and God heard David's prayer because Jesus issued forth the greatest king ever from the line of of David God honored his word today I say this to you the Lord's gonna honor his word to you this week have the boldness I dare you to ask God for the impossible I dare you to place or to place take off the limitations you've placed on the Lord things are going to come to pass like you've never believed tonight when you position yourself to pray and especially when we come together corporately to pray I want courageous prayers everyone say courageous prayers your servant has found the courage the boldness the bahisia the frankness of speech have you ever met a confident child it's wonderful to see her I'm not talking about an arrogant child there's something else right well uh, it's a little girl or boy that's confident it's like okay you can be the president they hold their own <laughs> you know and that's how God says come before me with confidence not arrogance but know your rights as my son pray not sheepish sheepishly go for the thing hold it and possess my will concerning your life pray confidently so what I want to what I will expect from this house is confident praying right never again say God if it's your will do XYZ don't want to hear those prayers say God I know what the will is now the yes it amen <laughs> tell someone we know what the will is right God's word reveals his will so let's just stand lift up your hands I'm gonna pray pray for you all I really believe we have an open heaven this house has an open heaven amen Jordan you are healed in the name of the Lord Jesus you are healed yeah heaven's will on your earth hey, your body is earth eh? body was made from earth the last item of earth was the body God took earth and he made the human body let the, let the will of heaven be done in your earth in your body in your dust amen lift your hands before the Lord now before I pray I want you to ask God for something all of us all of us young people uh, young children Jordan you know ask God for something just now, okay all of you right Leah Ray all of you here Avario all of you adults all of us I want you to dare to ask God for something you know is his will for your life right and I want you just to utter that before the Lord say God I'm not coming sheepishly or retractingly I come boldly to the throne of grace come in absolute confidence you have chosen me as your fellow worker your partner I am praying let your will be done let your kingdom come in this dynamic go ahead now and ask him just open your heart just ask him for that let you the servant of the Lord find courage to pray that prayer you are praying have the courage to pray that prayer you are praying I say it again to you have the courage to pray that prayer you are praying have the courage to pray that prayer you are praying 
because the Lord will hear you. The Lord will answer in the name of Jesus. Oh, God of heaven, yes. God of heaven, yes. God of heaven, hear our prayers. Let the will of heaven be done on earth. Let your will be done in every life, in every marriage. Come on, church, have the courage to pray. Have the boldness to pray like David did. Have the boldness to pray these prayers, oh God. Let your will be done, Father. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, Father. Do your work, God. Do a mighty work amongst us, God. In the name of Jesus. Answer every prayer. Answer every cry. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Answer every cry, I pray, Father. In Jesus' name. Your servants have boldness before you. Oh, we anticipate your doings. Let heaven's will be done on earth. In the name of Jesus. Let heaven's will be done, God. Thank you for our church building, Father. Thank you that we will access it soon. We have boldness to pray these prayers before you. Because you have revealed this. You have uncovered the ears of your servants. So help we have the boldness to pray this before you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Do it, Lord. Answer your people. Answer your people, God. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you have, un have uncovered the ears of your servants by revelation to hear your intent and your will concerning us. Now your servants, therefore, have found courage to pray these prayers before you. And you will hear the prayers of the righteous. You will see the prayers of the righteous. Hear and see our prayers, I pray, and answer your people swiftly. We bless you that your name be glorified in and through this. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. While you remain standing, would you take your communion emblems? We celebrate the Lord's body and his blood via these emblems. Remember the shared body and the poured out blood of Christ shared for our redemption. I was thinking the other day, you know when Jesus was baptized by John, the Bible says, and praying. Right? It says it specifically that he was in praying while John baptized him. So he starts his public ministry in, in prayer and he ended in his ministry in prayer before he went to the cross in the garden he prayed Jesus at the start of the process at the end of the process prayed the work of the cross the work of Calvary was baptized in prayer right? it was laced in prayer and as we observe his body and his blood today may we receive grace receive life receive health receive healing but more importantly, let's trust God that we would receive again a fresh impartation of the spirit of prayer. Say, God, as you did it, I want to both start and finish matters in prayer. Amen. Receive his body, receive his blood in the name of the Lord. Offering baskets are going to go around now. You can do that now. Um, to receive today's 
tithes, first fruits, and offerings. And we want to encourage you to give liberally and generously as unto the Lord. Gary, do you have that poster regarding the finance, the million rand thing? Um, we are trusting God to raise a million rand. Um, and we said we're going to give ourselves five months, I think a month or so, have, have passed already. Okay? And to date, we have about 15,000 rand uh, in terms of contributions that have come in towards this. So we want to raise at least a million rand. Now, this church can do it because we raised 500,000 rand in a few, in three months, I think, when, that we sold for the purchase of the building um, that Gate Ministries in Santon purchased in the course of this year. So, we anticipate our own building, but we want to raise the initial, everyone say initial goal. So, um, I do not mention this as maybe as often as I should. But uh, today, I just want to mention it again. Please, throughout the next few months, if ever you're moved to sow into this project, then please reference it accordingly, your name and the word building. It'll, so it can be immediately transferred into an investment account. It's a separate account that the church has, so we don't use that money for our month-to-month -month needs here. So um, the church bank details, they are on the screen. And we would encourage anybody watching online, if you feel you want to partner with us in this endeavor, then feel free to sow into this initiative. Um, if any of you need some encouragement regarding this matter, please watch my two teachings. It's called the Consecrated Offering or the Dedicated Offering or the Ordained Offering. It's available on our YouTube channel. I taught it in the course of this year over two Sundays. Okay. Um, so... Just in reference to the building, I really want to encourage you, give it a lot of propulsion in prayer, but also be practical, keep your eye out for stuff. Amen. Everyone say, it is time. It is time. Amen. So we're sensing this that has been brewing in our spirit that we need a place of our own. Amen. Amen. Today is fellowship, so please don't rush off. We're going into the adjacent room next door. Uh, time with this beverages and some light snacks. We can enjoy and just chat. Um, one with the other. Ting and your family, Stephanie as well, please. And uh, Andre, your parents, please, they mustn't leave. Just join us and have a brief chat there with us. House Church is the last meeting for the year this week, Wednesday. So please make it a good one. Amen. Those of you that are not in service, you can see many folk on here today for various reasons. Those, some, many are watching online, but please make certain you all are at House Church on Wednesday. It's a Zoom based meeting. So please make sure that you're in your respective groups. And on Wednesday, what I would like you to do is discuss these principles. I will update the note this afternoon because I have no wife. <laughs> Nothing else to do. I have to work. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> okay. And uh, I'll send you the note because she still has to edit it. So when she's back this evening, she'll probably do that in the course of tomorrow morning. I'll send it to you by Monday evening. You get the note of today's sermon. I have to just adjust a few things it hasn't gone according to what I prepared um, and then you can use that as the basis for your discussions but like I said I would really like you to probe the chapter we read now but also in the balance of the meeting spend 20 to 30 minutes praying best way is to just do it just just do it amen just do it and and pray amen for all of our services throughout December we meet at a quarter past eight unless I inform you otherwise, okay? Uh, so the next week is the 17th we meet, the 24th we meet, that's the day before Christmas, like a typical day like this. We won't have any service on Christmas Day itself. Um, and then on the 31st, it's a Sunday, we'll have a normal Sunday morning service where I'll share some prophetic insights uh, to you as well. Amen, so you have New Year's Eve off, okay? You can plan not to party hard, to pray hard, <laughs> okay, personally, etc. Amen. Who's just loving the spirit of prayer? They're really feeling this, I'm really just sensing such a intimacy and nearness to the Lord. It's very strange. All I know, He has called and we have responded. Amen. Great grace and abundant peace. Have a great Sunday to you all. Let's meet in the Jason room and have some fellowship together.